the next part, uh, I would request Dr. Rajesh Sena to call the next speaker. Yeah. Uh, it's my pleasure to invite uh, Dr. D. Ramamurthy, who is a doyen in the field of refractive uh, surgery, to present on uh, refractive surgery for hyperopia. <clears throat> Dr. Ramurthy is the chairman of uh, Eye Foundation Group of Hospitals and uh, is a master in refractive procedures. Thank you, Rajesh. Are my slides seen? Yeah. 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 Thank you so much, Namrata and team, for this uh, invitation to this excellent session. What I'm, I'm shifting gears and talking about refractive surgery for hyperopia. And uh, basically, the, uh, it's a less talked about subject simply because the prevalence is not so high. While myopia is about 30% of the population affected, hyperopia affects just about 3% of the Indian population. So hence it's lesser in incidence. And one of some basics have to be kept in mind irrespective of what modality you use for the treatment. A cycloplegic refraction with homotropin is a must, just with the cycloventilate is not enough. And correct the maximal acceptance with fogging. So the role of the optometrist is extremely important. And you have to uh, make the, most of the latent hyperopia manifest and try to go ahead and treat that. It's most often said that the, the regression is more often with the hyperopia. I believe it's more because we are undercorrecting most of our hyperopes and as age advances, more of the hyperopia becomes manifest. And that's why it's believed that regression is more common. In case you are able to correct the appropriate amounts of hyperopia, maybe the incidence of regression will be much less with laser vision correction. Uh, initially, aiming at a slight post-operative myopia, maybe even if you overcorrect by about 0.5 diopters and the patient has 0.5 to 0.75 diopters, it's okay because with the accommodation uh, relaxing, the uh, acceptance of the patient is going to improve. Age of the treatment is again 18 years or more, but it's not because the hyperopia is progressive. In myopia, the, it progresses simply because the eyeball enlarges. The eyeball cannot have, become smaller in eye, the hyperope, but it's simply because the manifest component of the hyperopia is difficult to determine in a much younger individual. And that's the reason that in the 30s or so, you get much better results than the patients in their 20s. And uh, as patients' accommodation goes down, there's often concomitant astigmatism associated with hyperopia. That's also that's something that needs to be uh, dealt with. Most of the eczema laser company says that up to about six diopters of hyperopia or cylinder can be dealt with. And uh, though we often limit ourselves to about three diopters, last thin uniplanar flaps is what is recommended for the simple reason that most of the ablation happens in the periphery. And we aim at a 6.5 millimeter optic zone size in these uh, cases. A large angle kappa is often concomitant with the uh, hyperopia. That's the reason something like a contour treatment where the treatment is centered on the visual uh, axis rather than on the pupil center is somewhat preferred. As we all know, ablation profile for myopia is right in the center. And in hyperopia, as I already mentioned, it's most often in the periphery. When there is coexistent astigmatism, there's more of treatment in the axis of the astigmatism. And uh, as I already mentioned, the results of laser vision correction is less predictable beyond three diopters. It's simply because not only uh, because it's the undercorrection of hyperopia, because it is an indirect treatment where you are treating in the periphery and expecting the cornea to steepen in the center and the biomechanics of this uh, cornea, as well as the variability of tissue from one individual to another, they, uh, makes the results variable. On the other hand, it's a direct treatment of a myopic cornea because of which the flattening effect is more predeterminate. Uh, as you can see over here, this is what we do. Basically, it's pre-treatment, this is post-treatment, this is what has, it has been achieved, and it is a controlled ectasia, controlled steepening that has been achieved in the center for correcting hyperopia. It said that you do not leave behind cornea steeper than 49 diopters. When you go on to the algorithm, please remember, for each diopter of correction, you steepen the cornea just by about 0.6 diopters. So when you correct three diopters of hyperopia, you correct the, you steepen the cornea just by about two diopters. When uh, you make the cornea more hyperprolate than this, it's not only a poor quality of vision because you end up having something like a nipple cone, but also it predisposes to dryness because it interferes with the flow of tears across the conjunctival sac. 
A fake intraocular lenses, to my mind, has a significant role in the rehabilitation of hyperopic patients because the predictability of visual outcomes is uh, much better. Faster visual rehabilitation, what you get on first, uh, first day post-operative is what the patient lives with till he gets a cataract. More stable refraction, less incidence of dry eye because the cornea has not been dealt with and better visual quality because there's no induction of visual aberrations. But you need to keep in mind that unlike the uh, myopic uh, fake intraocular lenses, which are plano concave, in hyperopia it's biconvex. Usually the central thickness can be as high as 250 to 300 microns. That's the reason some recommend that you uh, do not take up less than AC depth of three millimeters, but we ourselves go up to 2.8 millimeters. It's also important to look at the angle because uh, when you start out with an angle of 30 degrees, it diminishes by almost 10 degrees when you put up a uh, put in a fake intraocular lens. So anything less than 30 degrees, maybe that's a relative contraindication. Most often we do not have a central hole in the ICLs, in the fake ICLs and ICLs. None of the hyperopic lenses have it. In the IPCL, up to plus 3.5 diopter, you have a central hole. More thickness, because the central thickness are higher. That's the reason it becomes technically more challenging to create a hole. And if it's in a thicker optic, you have a hole, then there's greater incidence of scattering and dysphotopsia. But uh, up to 15 diopters of uh, hyperopic correction is possible with customized uh, fake intraocular lenses. And presbyopic fake intraocular lenses is another way to go. And uh, where you are able to connect not only hyperopia, astigmatism, but also uh, introduce a certain amount of trifocality. They are available from plus 1.5 to 3.5 diopters. And when you are using a plus 3 diopter rad, what you get is a 2.1 diopter for near and 1.2 diopters for intermediate. I'm a recent adapter to this, but I think uh, Dr. Titial has been using it for quite some time. I do not dilate my patients uh, preoperatively for fake intraocular lenses. And that's a helon that flows out. And that's just a routine introduction of a fake intraocular lens. And uh, that's the diffractive uh, optics of the lens, uh, trifocal uh, lens, which gives a fairly good correction. My initial experience has been pretty good with these lenses. Prelux is another uh, aspect which is gaining popularity because of the accuracy of our pre the pre present biometry, availability of premium uh, intraocular lenses, excellent post-surgical visual outcome, an active lifestyle even in the 50s and later. And obviously, a desire to get rid of uh, glasses, which even in, in, we in our 60s have it. So obviously, this is a typical patient for prelex for me, a lady who is 54 in age, and you can see a significant hyperopia and um, uh, presbyopic correction that can be got rid of. This is the kind of uh, power that you deal with. And uh, usually what you end up with these situations, whether it's a trifocal or a synergy is a situation like this which makes the patient extremely happy. And especially if the patient has a, a shallow AC depth and predisposition to angle closure glaucoma, that's also that's something that's taken care of. In the other extreme, you have uh, the cases with extremes of hyperopia, even in the plus 16 diopter, I've treated even in a 28 year old, even though lenses up to 65 diopters can be manufactured, I believe that it's the better way to go is to uh, put in a standard lens of about plus 40 diopters and then go ahead and implant a sulcoflex lens of what I'm presenting here. For each diopter of hyperopic correction, you need 1.5 diopters in your intraocular lens, in your sulcoflex lens. It's a 14 millimeter overall diameter lens with a 6.5 millimeter optic. And the Indian version of these lenses at a more cost effective manner is also becoming available. Because of the vagaries of refractive uh, uh, biometry, you know, irrespective of the formula that you use when you go on to extremes of refractive error, I believe debulking the maximal amount of hyperopia with the primary lens and then calculating the balance amount and doing this is a good way to go. You can see the post-op OCT and the post-op streclam photographs of this extreme hyperopic patient who has been dealt with. So obviously hyperopia, we owe it to our patients to deal with uh, all kinds of refractive error at all ages. And LASIK, PRK, SMILE, SMILE, though it's been talked about, has really not uh, become uh, stable and accepted. Extra procedures, another way to go. Fake intraoc lenses, fesbiopic fake intraoc lenses, prelex and piggyback lenses are complete the armamentarium that we have as far as uh, 